we have two interlock aims. One is to uh, support, buttress, defend the Aristotelian uh, theory of cultivation and motivational habituation, what goes on in the apprenticeship process, uh, by providing a neuroscientific account of its enabling mechanisms. And the second is to contribute to an integration of moral psychology and uh, philosophy and uh, to cognitive neuroscience in a novel way based on a recent uh, essential turn in cognitive science. And uh, I think that the second goal, although it's in a way a means to the end of the first, is also an end in itself because this type of integration has not, to our knowledge, been yet attempted, in part due to the novelty of this uh, cognitive, uh, this change in uh, cognitive science. So uh, our question, the one question is the following, given that uh, the virtuous apprenticeship path towards uh, virtue and, and mastery is often either not taken or if it's taken, it's soon abandoned on the one hand, and on the other hand, that the virtuous apprenticeship path is sometimes taken, we want to understand what the conditions are under which apprenticeship really gets underway and keeps uh, going the right direction. Um, now, how do we propose to answer this question, which is, of course, a traditional question in moral philosophy and psychology? Recently developed models of cognitive architecture, which may be called predictive HBMs, I'll tell you what the predictive HBM is in a moment, seems precisely poised to provide at least the beginnings of a very different kind of answer, different from the usual commonsensical uh, edifying um, folk psychological kind of answer. Uh, an answer that's naturalistic and rests on uh, mechanisms lying in, both inside the skull and outside in the environment. So our team combines, I think, the necessary competencies. So I told you about Alberto Masala, who uh, knows about virtue theory. Uh, then there are our neuroscientists. Jean Donizot is a theoretical neuroscientist with a very strong applied mathematics background. He's been a close collaborator of Carl Friston and uh, a, main, a major contributor to this Bayesian turn that I will talk about in a little while. Mathias Pessiglione is more of a wetware biological neuroscientist. Uh, he uh, studies uh, mostly motivation and the acquisition of advanced skills, for example, in sports people, uh, from a neuroscientific and a psychological experimental viewpoint. And then I, in this particular case, I regard myself as sort of someone who specializes in studying the foundations of models in cognitive science. It's something that I've been doing for many, many years. So uh, to, to, to summarize, we want to discover, model, and test factors that would unlock our ability co to, to, to cultivate complex motivational habits. And now you go. No, you can handle it directly from there. OK. <laughs> Following the lead of philosophers such as uh, McIntyre and Julia Annas, we see Aristotle as the originator of a conception of practical cultivation, of learning and skill building through practice that offer us an extremely insightful understanding on how the self is built and integrated in moral and non-moral domain alike. Practical cultivation leads to the building of substantial skill or praxis, defined in stark contrast to merit technical or instrumental skill. Technical skill can be learned for whatever pre-existing motivation, for example, learning mathematics just to pass an exam, and then deploy to serve any goal. Motivation is external. In praxis, motivation is slowly internalized while practicing the activity itself, in the same long-term process whereby procedural knowledge is gradually absorbed. According to McIntyre and other defenders of the virtual uh, skill analogy, this process under, underlines both moral cultivation and the pursuit of mastery in fields such as sport, music, or the arts. It is essentially a process of apprenticeship, of learning from practice with the help of guidance of role models. 
So with the help of mentors, a tennis player will start off integrating both basic movement and rudimentary aspects of the right attitude to have in the field. Later on in our path, intermediate level of technique will be infused with a more refined understanding of priority in a tennis game. Eventually, she will, she will become a master, acting resolutely out of a sophisticated understanding of the art of tennis. At this point, she will have internalized a normative sensitivity that, while domain-specific, defines her identity at a very deep level. Moral cultivation is a form of practical cultivation that goes through the same stages. For example, a compassionate teacher, starting from a basic understanding of suffering and difficulties in students, after much experience and imitation of role mo models, attain expertise manifested as subtle moral sensitivity dictating when to intervene and for what reason. With respect to non-moral domains, the difference is that sensitivity, if anything, moral sensitivity, if anything, will play an even stronger role in defining the self than mastering music or tennis. For example, an expert tennis player will experience uneasiness at the sight of someone making subtle mistake she will never make, a kind of aesthetic suffering or disgust when confronted with bad tennis playing. But a compassionate teacher will feel a considerably stronger form of moral disgust towards subtle but perverse form of bullying. Motivational habituation is and must be self-sustaining. We are drawn into the practice, as it, as it were. Beginner understanding stimulates the desire to reach intermediate understanding and so on up to the expert understanding and sensitivity in a self-sustaining feedback loop. You can start as a tennis player just to please your beloved father, but if tennis is a practice rather than a mer merely technical skill, you have to play expert level tennis for the right reason. Now, philosophical interest in the Aristotelian model of cultivation is vanishing as recent evidence stresses fragility. Motivational habituation, the delicate process of internalizing the right reason to act, the right normative sensitivity, is often disrupted by strong external forces. Within moral cultivation, it has to overcome forces such as egoism, hedonism, and social pressure. And if situationist philosophers are right, it loses out to them more often than, than not. And in no moral domains, motivational habituation loses out to the forces of laziness. Against the ambitious interpretation of tennis, music, or medicine as praxis defended by McIntyre, there is abundant proof of stagnation at plateau in all fields of expertise. Narrow contest lock skills are built instead of complex and flexible one. Doctor and other professionals fail to improve with the years of practice. The static routine of experts leads to error of familiarity, where new situations are mistaken for usual condition, leading, for example, to traffic or nuclear accident. Finally, transfer of knowledge fails even among closed fields. A naturalistic defense of motivational habituation must start from an understanding of the root cause of fragility. According to our model, based on general evolutionary, cognitive as well as psychological evidence, motivational fragility is the outcome of a form of default conservatism. In spite of abundant information availability, by default, we unconsciously minimize sophistication in order to reduce bioenergetic cost of learning. This built-in trend is what produces rigid and contest-locked skills, which are built only to serve specific goals at a lower possible cost for our brain. Now, the possibility of practical cultivation rests on the fact that in the right condition, investment in complexity takes place. We are able to invest and learn on subtle and sophisticated pattern which produce flexible mastery and make motivational habituation possible. In previous research, published in the chapter Mastering Wisdom of the forthcoming book uh, From Personality to Virtue, I have explored existing educational theory in cognitive learning science, describing the right condition for investment in complexity and sophisticated motivational habituation. Beretta Scardamalia defines the feature of classroom as knowledge building community, where pre-existing interest in learning and understanding is not presupposed, but instilled to gradual motivational habituation. The contribution of this kind of proposal in cognitive learning science and in the psychology of expertise is the attempt at making the idea of apprenticeship more precise. They define the right type of apprenticeship condition. This is extremely valuable for virtue ethics, as apprenticeship understood at a general common sense and phenomenological level has been unable to convince the skeptics and answer the charge of fragility. With, with respect to this effort of definition of apprenticeship, 
Our project has a different but complementary goal. We aim at studying fundamental acratic biases and obstacles that prevent us from following the path of apprenticeship. Daniel? No. Is on this? No. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> you, you. Me? Yeah. Comment this? Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll go. I'll go. I'll, I'm, I'll quickly. Um, walk you through uh, the Bayesian revolution. So there's been a Bayesian tsunami in cognitive science uh, that sort of has now come to a head and is changing the face of cognitive science unbeknownst to many people. Um, and it takes, it's a long tradition that goes back to Helmholtz and the basic idea is the empirical, the empiricist uh, idea that there's a lot of information in the environment and what held this Bayesian uh, approach for a long time was the inability to represent higher order statistical uh, regularities in the environment. Now that we have those tools, we can capture, we can hope to capture those regularities and therefore enormously increase our understanding of powerful uh, uh, learning mechanisms. So, uh, the Bayesian, the new models combine the best of two worlds. The ability of classical approaches in cognitive science to deal with complex structured representations and then the ability attributed to this general movement sometimes called neural nets or connectionism to account for learning. Uh, this new sort of model is called an HBM, a hierarchical Bayesian model. And uh, it's used most effectively in predictive mode. Um, uh, and th this mode essentially uh, says, let me guess, and if I'm wrong, I'll make the necessary adjustments. So the model starts with priors, and then if it's wrong, it corrects, and it corrects layer by layer with a retro -prop propagation of the error signal. So I'm a little bit short of time, uh, so I'll run you through this. So what's the advantage of uh, such models for our problem? Well, first of all, they embody conservatism. Deep learning is costly, and uh, HBM will only go as far as needed uh, under normal circumstances. But exposed in the, to the, in the right conditions which are in the environment, it will undergo deep change. It will accept to change its priors way up in the, up in the hierarchy of layers. Uh, HBMs can account for inter-individual differences as well as temporal intra intra-individual differences in the capacity for deep learning, so they look promising in terms of the phenomenology of uh, habituation. And they seem to be able to handle, and that's an important point, in an integrated manner, the motivation and the knowledge uh, dimensions. So applying this framework to our problem, I should stress that it's by no means a trivial task. A lot of conceptual work has to be done. These are difficult uh, paradigms. Uh, and establishing a c conceptual common ground between philosophy and neuroscience from which to attack this problem requires considerable effort. At the same time, we want to provide an existence proof showing on a special case that, can, that it can be done and that it is uh, profitable. So <coughs> uh, our first step will be to focus on motivation rather than learning and motivation blended together, which is the second step and examine what neuroscience and Bayesian modeling can tell us about acrasia in normal subjects. And so we uh, propose a two-pronged attack with HBM modeling on one hand and uh, psychological and neuropsychological evidence on the other. So I've run out of time. Uh, you may ask us about our experimental setup, the potential hurdles, and how we are going to uh, help ourselves to some people around us and some ideas around us, and that's the end. I'm sorry for been running out of time. I'd like to ask about your experimental setup. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, up, 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 up. Here we go. Okay. So. Uh, Do you want to explain? Do you want to explain this? Uh, yeah, thing basically, thing? Go ahead. the idea is to uh, there are existing uh, motivational biases in the literature, uh, like for example, discussing with our colleagues 
uh, bias on uh, effort, underestimation. People are gonna think they're gonna do some action, but then there's a s signal from a specific circuit that during the action that they stop is not predicted. So uh, we, we, we want to study the literature to find um, interesting bias to use in this task. And then basically the idea is to find a different learning uh, condition which have a, a different statistical structure that will uh, favor or not uh, complex learning, and in this, in this case, it's oper operationalized as uh, elimination of the bias. So we think that uh, we can uh, eliminate bias in certain statistical learning conditions, but th this is the idea. And uh, we want to study the literature to, to find the, the, it could be this effort bias, but this is the first hypothesis came out with uh, discussing with our colleague. It could be other things. And uh, Bayesianism is great to check for statistical condition as uncertainty, volatility, redundancy of information, how much, how many times the same information is found in which, which pattern. And uh, since we are committed to the Aristotelian idea that the process is self-sustaining, we think that in the right environment, complex learning and as a consequence, elimination of uh, acratic bias that, that stop it will, will happen. So basically this is uh, the idea. And, and building uh, is, um, a computational model, which will, uh, by Asian computational model, which will be done by our colleague, of course. More questions? Howard. Uh, can you say something about the data that you're going to apply the Bayesian modeling to? It wasn't clear to me what you're applying Bayesian modeling to. Neuroimaging so, data or behavioral data? So, uh, yeah, uh, basically the, our colleague works with a, a task that elicited a preference first. It could be any kind of uh, game, like uh, ask people to uh, rate the interesting picture, or they have several paradigms. The, the interesting thing is to find, a, um, to fix the preferences of the participants of our task. And then there's, the, there's a choice task where uh, this they should act on this preference. And for example, concerning the effort, they, they, they work with um, an Andal device where people have to put some uh, effort uh, and um, the device uh, register the level of effort. And this there could be a mismatch with, um, with the preference established in the sense that people should do the maximum effort, for example, for something they like, and they don't. So this is, will be uh, roughly the way to oper personalize uh, a creator. And, and then uh, we, uh, the group will go through, through a learning task in different conditions, will be, which will be a, basically a learning a, a task kind of game. Norm <coughs> generally, they work with a, on a computer support. And uh, the, same, the same task, the end to show in which condition the, bi uh, the bias uh, stay or, or goes away. And basically the, the model should fit the choice. Uh, the best model will fit the, what people do in this, this uh, what people do in, the, the, in this. Uh, the force measurements? Th this is, uh, uh, under this, is, uh, supposing we are doing that. Basically, uh, we think that we, we, uh, we have first a uh, conceptual task that could lead us to find better candidate, but this is the hypothesis that came out. So this is, let's say that this is our current hypothesis. Yeah. They've already done, uh, not to test this Aristotelian hypothesis, but they already already done studies and models with uh, this force measurement. Uh, maybe uh, I should stress again that a, a, a large part of the work as we see it, certainly from our end, uh, will be conceptual. Uh, so there is an empirical part that will be carried out more in the motivation and brain and behavior lab, and which uh, in our mind provides, as I was saying, in sort of an existence proof showing on small models, of, you know, simple cases of acratic motivation, uh, acratic situations, how it might work. But a lot of the work will be done uh, on the conceptual level, actually, trying to uh, really make it transparent and understandable by old concern, which is far from the case, 
the rather difficult uh, mathematical and statistical models uh, uh, done by our, our computer scientists. Well, let's wait for it. Owen. Um, so thank you. Um, yeah, this is a different kind of approach uh, um, in following up, as you say, the Bayesian uh, revolution. So one thing that's important in such models, right, are how you conceive of the initial settings of the system. Um, and um, so I, I have a question about modeling the tennis game analogy. It's a very helpful analogy. But um, you might think um, that if virtues are skills, uh, then what are vices? Now, you could go two ways on vices. You could think vices are skills, too. And, um, <clears throat> or you could think more along the lines of what I think what you're assuming, which is that there's like a cratic interference in the system so that most people have these skills up and running like, you know, honesty is the best policy. And then all of a sudden, there's a temptation to lie and that how somehow, that, then, then the analogy though becomes puzzling because it would be like having an urge to hit the tennis ball into the stadium or something like that, right? Which is kind of an odd thing to think that we have. So I'm just, so what I'm really asking a question about is the sort of philosophical foundations of the modeling procedure. Your hunch is that virtues are, should be modeled along the lines of skills. And uh, what, about, uh, what about vices or learning a, uh, dispositions in the other direction? You thinking the same way or really something very uh, different? Well, I think that the, the most common ca case uh, in, is the absence of, of virtue, which is uh, not the same thing as, uh, as vice. Right, okay. So, and uh, to answer the, the part of your question on uh, acrasia, uh, I think that acrasia intervenes in stopping the learning of the virtue itself. So. <laughs> A good tennis won't be a tennis player won't be acratic, and a virtue person won't be acratic because he has learned to a certain point. I don't think that at any moment he has a new temptation. And uh, well, vice, I will say that uh, that bad, bad habits, but not explained necessarily. But the, 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 there is an asymmetry. Uh, I will I wouldn't say that they are, they are skilled for the for the for the evil. I would say that bad habits and the, on the other side, virtue are, are, are similar to skill, well-trained skill. Let me just ask a, real, a quick follow-up. So uh, in the mid-90s, uh, Paul Churchland actually wrote a paper in which I think it's called Moral Network Theory. Uh, it's using connectionist modeling uh, to, for virtue. And um, one of the sort of uh, debates that uh, came from there um, was that a really good learning system should reach equilibrium, moral equilibrium, in something like a sensible, Humean sensible, naive kind of case. It should actually learn when it can, for example, if honesty, it's learning honesty, but it should also learn when uh, uh, dishonesty will pay. And so this is, so is, is a concern about like what the world will, as it were, <laughs> call upon. If it's a purely a learning system, then it's not clear how Right. sort of high-level normativity will constrain it as opposed to strategic rationality. Right. This, is where the, uh, this is where maybe the apprenticeship model is, is, is going to work. In other words, uh, if you're just left to your own device in the wide, wild world without a master to show the way or some equivalent institution, you're indeed liable to pick up bad habits, which has happened to most of us, I must say, at least to me. Uh, and that's just because I was not exposed to the proper environment. The master sort of organizes the environment in such a way that the succession of examples or situations he or she is exposed to will make the uh, system converge in the right way. And obviously, a lot of work has to be done to understand how it works. We, we see how it works with good masters and good apprenticeships yeah. in the best cases. You know, yes. Great masters. Yeah, we, are, we work general. within this framework to make it more but, precise. But definitely, we, I mean, part of the investigation, and it would be a small piece in a large, uh, big effort, uh, would be indeed to sort of understand better what the, how these examples and situations, in what order they're presented, and how, how the apprentice is supposed to extract the right information in order to move in the right direction. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Okay.